This video was brought to you by our backers on Patreon, like Roan H. Thanks, Roan. If you sign up now, you can get an exclusive TLDR lanyard absolutely free. Find out more at the end of the video. China and the US have an increasingly difficult relationship, with America's political and societal attitudes towards China changing significantly during the last three presidencies. So, in this video, we're going to be taking a look at the approach the US has been taking to the Asian superpower. First, we'll look at Trump's China policy, then we're going to examine Biden's policy, do a bit of comparison, and finally, we're going to ask whether Biden's current policy stands a chance of working. So, let's start with Trump. Trump's China policy was primarily about trade. According to Trump, US trade with China was problematic for two reasons. Firstly, the US was running a trade deficit with China. Essentially, the US was buying more stuff from China than China was buying from the US. This is sort of what you'd expect. China manufactures cheaper goods than the US, and US consumers buy more than their Chinese counterparts. Now, economists disagree as to whether sustained trade deficits are bad, good, or just what happens when a country that likes imports starts trading with a country that likes exports. Trump, however, was 100% sure that trade deficits are terrible. The worst trade deal ever made by any country, I think, in the world. It's just hard to pin down Trump's precise reasoning, but the basic idea seems to be that trade deficits are bad for jobs because trade deficits mean that you're not selling as much produce, which means fewer jobs in production and manufacturing. Essentially, Trump blames the trade deficit for the decline of classic blue-collar American manufacturing jobs. Of course, while this might be true, any free market economist will point out that these jobs have been replaced by China because China can produce the same goods for cheaper, and, well, that's why consumers stopped buying from American manufacturers. Essentially, while the trade deficit might be bad for certain American manufacturers, it might be better for American consumers insofar as it means cheaper goods. Anyway, trade deficit debate aside, the other issue Trump had with China's trade was that he thought they were engaged in unfair trade practices. There were basically three specific allegations. Distorting state subsidies, currency devaluation, and intellectual property theft. So let's start with distorting state subsidies. Essentially, this is when a national government gives money and tax breaks to a specific industry for strategic reasons. For example, China is accused of over-subsidising its steel industry. A report by the American Iron and Steel Institute concluded that the Chinese government had granted more than $52 billion worth of subsidies from 2002 to 2007, allowing the Chinese steel production to increase by more than 170% between 2000 and 2005. As of 2007, the Chinese government also owned 8 out of 10 of the largest steel manufacturers outright. Now, usually subsidies can be a bit of a waste of money, because if a company or industry needs subsidies to stay afloat, then it's probably not in great financial nick. So, why is the Chinese government paying so much money for its own steel industry? Well, if you ask Trump, he'll tell you that China's plan is to produce so much super cheap steel that everyone just buys Chinese steel. This means that other steel producers will go out of business, which will eventually mean that everyone will be relying on China for steel. This is a serious geostrategic advantage. For example, in the event of war, this means that you basically need to be able to trade with China if you want to build tanks or missiles or, well, anything really. Sure, you could go and try and reanimate your own steel industry instead, but if you're at war, you probably don't have the time. Anyway, while China deny that this is their end goal, they do seem to have made good progress cornering the international steel market. In 2004, the world's top 10 steel producers included only one Chinese company. The other top firms were American, European, Japanese and South Korean. Back then, just 25.8% of the world's steel was made in China. In 2018, six of the world's largest steel companies were Chinese, some of them government-owned, and China accounted for 51.3% of global steel production. And that number doesn't even include production by Chinese companies in other countries. All right, on to currency devaluation. Most currencies are floating currencies, which mean that their relative value is determined by demand in the market. For example, when Brexit happened, the pound fell in value because investors weren't optimistic about the UK economy. The UK government didn't like this, but there wasn't much they could do about it. The UN, however, isn't completely free-floating. Instead, it works under a managed float system. 
which basically means that the Chinese government decides how much it trades against other international currencies. They don't decide it exactly, but the UN can only fluctuate by 1%, and they'll intervene to keep it within that range. Again, while China denies it, most academics and economists do think that the Chinese undervalue the UN. The IMF, for example, estimated in 2014 that if it was a floating currency, one UN would have been worth about 25 cents. At the time, one UN was worth about 16 cents. According to Trump, China does this to make its exports unfairly competitive because a cheap currency means cheaper goods from that country, thereby unfairly undercutting American manufacturers. Finally, intellectual property theft. Essentially, Trump claimed that China didn't respect intellectual property rights. Essentially, Trump claimed that China was stealing patented American technology developed by American academics and departments and using it for themselves without respecting intellectual property laws. FBI Director Christopher Wray estimated in February 2020 that Chinese intellectual property theft was costing the US between $300 and $600 billion a year. Anyway, Trump's response to this was to engage in a trade war with China, which basically involved putting prohibitively high tariffs on Chinese goods, including a 25% tariff on steel. It's worth noting that Trump's trade war wasn't China-specific. He put tariffs on goods from basically everywhere, even traditional allies like Canada and the EU. Anyway, in retaliation, China put up its own tariffs on American imports like soybeans, corn and pork. This was basically Trump's China policy. He was predominantly worried about the trade deficit because of its impact on American jobs and industries, and his response was to engage in a trade war, which ended with the signing of a phase one trade deal in January 2020. Under the terms of the deal, China agreed to buy more American imports, which Trump presumably thought would help American producers, although some agreed that the whole process just hurt American consumers. So, what about Biden? Well, Biden's approach is similar to Trump's, insofar as he's taken a strong stance, which is sort of unsurprising, given the American public's broadly negative attitude towards China. Both Biden and Trump are, to some degree, protectionists when it comes to American domestic industries. But, while Trump was mainly worried about trade deficits and old-school American manufacturing jobs, Biden is mainly worried about geopolitics. While Biden does occasionally talk about how China has stolen American jobs, his plan for jobs isn't about reinvigorating the American coal sector, but using his climate plan to create 10 million clean energy jobs. Similarly, while both Biden and Trump agree that the US needs a domestic steel industry, Biden's focus is more on the national security aspect, while Trump, although he was definitely conscientious of the national security element, was more focused on the pure economics of it. In June, for example, Biden's administration completed a supply chain review that identified areas that China dominates, including rare earth metals, lithium and cobalt, all of which are vital for high-capacity batteries, and called for America to work with other countries to reduce their reliance on Chinese producers. This focus on geopolitics also means that Biden is far more diplomatic than Trump was. Trump's trade war was directed at everyone, whereas Biden wants to build a sort of anti-China alliance, which Biden likes to frame as the Democrats against the autocrats. He's made some progress on this front. In March, Canada, Britain and the EU joined the US in imposing sanctions on Chinese officials and entities over the Uyghur camps in Xinjiang. And, in June, both the G7 and the NATO summit both produced statements recognising the threat posed by China. But it's not going to be easy. After the chaos of Trump, both Merkel and Macron have stressed the need for an independent EU-China policy, and even Boris Johnson said he didn't want to scare away investment because of an anti-China spirit. So, in short, Biden and Trump have taken similar positions insofar as both have taken strong stances against China, and both have resorted to some form of protectionism for domestic American industries. However, they're different insofar as Biden isn't worried about trade deficits, but instead about China's geopolitical rise. This also means that Biden is more diplomatic than Trump was, realising that the only way to effectively maintain America's geopolitical standing will be via some sort of anti-China coalition. In this sense, perhaps Biden's China policy is an improvement on Trump's. Trump was basically fighting an unsustainable diplomatic war with everyone, and Biden is right to recognise that America's geopolitical status depends on its allies. However, Biden isn't really giving a positive reason for this coalition. 
all he's really saying is that we should be allies because we're all scared of China, and this probably won't be enough to convince the Macrons and Merkels of the world. If Biden wants to be successful in this regard, he'll probably have to describe the American vision for the future in positive terms, not just as not China. Ultimately though, as time goes on, securing allies in this fight might become harder. Countries are becoming more and more reliant on China, even the US's natural European allies, with this stunning graph showing the huge shift between the US and China, with the Asian superpower having closer economic ties to essentially every country around the world. So, while allies might be somewhat willing to join the fight, if China's influence only increases, they may become concerned about biting the hand that trades with them. What do you think? Does the US need to take a tougher stance on this, or is Biden's strategy a good one? And what do you think of the huge shift in American attitudes towards China in the past few years? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. As I said at the start of this video, we're running a Patreon promotion whereby every Patreon paying more than $5 a month can get an absolutely free never for sale lanyard. To claim yours, just sign up to the TLDR Patreon and then click the link to the store. Signing up not only snags you a lanyard, but also gets you other perks like early access to videos, exclusive live events, merch discounts and more. Find out what you can get and sign up by clicking the link in the description below.